Hey traders, this is Tosh. I go by tbradley90 in the My Investing Club chat. A general reminder for those who do not know, MIC is having a one-year anniversary event where Bao is going to be trading live in front of our members. It's coming up August 17th. Mark your calendars. As an added benefit for our members, the event is 100% and exclusively free for annual and lifetime members. While lifetime, on top of that, get extra coaching before the event and guaranteed front row seating. While most charge for these events, we show our support by making it, again, free for annual and lifetime members. If you are interested in signing up for this event, DM TBradley90 in MIC Slack chat and or email myself at tosh at myinvestingclub.com. Now, we have a very special video for you guys this week as Austin, who goes by Aloha Trader in chat and one of our head moderators, brings back his weekly webinar series. And this week is episode eight in which he talks about what time frame are you trading, where he breaks down MIC strategies, some of his trades in his trade recaps, and also a good look at the market, market sentiment, and what has been going on as of late. And while today is just a preview of the full-length video, if you want to watch the full-length or any of our exclusive content, then become a member of MIC. So what time frame are you trading? Uh, so today, um, if this is your first webinar, what I normally do is I'll go over the, the layout here. We're going to go over the key traders of the last week or two um, because I, I didn't have a webinar last week. We're, it's kind of like two weeks because it's 4th of July. I, I go over the weekly, um, I, what I consider to be the weekly market sentiment of the small cap land, kind of um, where I think, like, what I think's working, what I think's not working. Going to go over, I usually have a couple of trader topics that I want to talk about. Normally, it's like themes of the week, you know, some stuff that we're talking about, you know, in chat a lot or recurring themes. Like, I think a couple of times, like we were talking about hard stops. One time we were talking about how smaller size leads to um leads to more gains than larger size you know just kind of recurring themes of the week um and then each week I, i'll change up the, the key segment of the of the week and this week um uh time frame falls into like an actual like trading center execution type stuff sometimes we have a psychology what i call a psychology board or the strategy board where i break down strategies today we're going to be talking about time frames with, which falls under trading center and then we're going to end the webinar with the q a uh, so this one I think was last week, but I didn't get to go over it just because of the lack of webinar last week. But this was OSS. This was this was the day that the market was open for only a half day. So I think this was on Wednesday. And the thing about half days in trading is there's a self-fulfilling prophecy where everyone wants to leave, right? It's a not only like so not only do we get off on Thursday, but it's a half day on on Wednesday and because Friday is typically slow, it's almost like everyone wants to take the whole week off. So it almost become half days become like a race in the market, right? It's a race to see who, you know, like who can make their money the fastest and get the F out, right? And so this is why volume typically likes to die off really early um, on these half days. So like basically the half day, like the first hour kind of turns into like the first 30 minutes, you know? So that was kind of going through my head with this trade. Um, but anyway, to get into the trade, this is an example of a, of a theme I'm going to talk about today where I was using the range, right? OSS, I was using the range. So a lot of the times when I make this first resistance short, um, there's a resistance level that I'm basing a trade off of. And if I want to base like a thesis trade on it, right? If I want to base like an entire, um, like kind of like a, a big trade on it, then um, I'm typically going to want to let it test for a little bit while, let it confirm to me that it's the top, at least before I put any kind of size on the trade, right? Not the case with this trade. So with this trade, this is what um, Bao and I kind of talk about the first resistance short, where you you have to kind of be brave in these kind of trades. But what allows you to be brave is knowing that your risk is planned, under control, and in check. When you know what your risk is and, and you plan your risk out ahead of time, there is no fear, right? You can enter these kinds of trades without fear. Uh, CETX, I think this is today. I, you can, as you can see, I did an amazing job. I'm the best coverer in the entire world. Um, uh, this is the same idea, right? I, I, let, I, I, wait, for the, I wait for the range to be um, put in here. Uh, the, the pre, in this case, it's pre-market. And I'm basing my trade off the pre-market high and I'm willing to, to go into this trade because I'm thinking 
um, that the range is set and I have a planned risk and I don't have a fear of just throwing the order up here, right? So again, I waited for the first move and used this as my resistance and this is the first time it's testing. Now, you notice like it's not as high as the resistance as in, as in the previous trade, right? This is, this is, this is you know, I was willing to um, move it down and maybe, you know, like, like this is just, I thought 320 might hold, right? Like it's, sometimes I have an order at like 327 or something, but if the price stalls at like 320 or I'm, I'm moving that order down, right? And I do that on a case per case basis. Um, sorry for this. Yeah, so sometimes I use stalls. I will use a stall, not necessarily as an entry signal, but um, if I already planned an entry close to the stall, I'm, I'm typically definitely moving the order down, right? I do that all the time. Like I'll, I'll have an order at like 324, 327, and I'll have my finger on the replace button at 19 or 18 because I'm anticipating that like what I, I don't want to miss my cover by a cent, right? I don't want to miss my cover by a cent or two cents. That drives me up the wall. So what I'm doing is I have my orders probably, I, I can't even remember. I think I probably had it at 27, quickly moved it down to like 19, right? Uh, CEI. So I have a, I had a couple trades in this and I'm going to be doing a more in-depth um, recap on this um later um uh i i'll probably do it tonight i actually i have a dentist appointment later so i don't know if i'll be able to talk very well but um uh yeah so i i kind of messed up on it the first day not so bad like i longed it right away at the open because this is the classic setup right this is um uh, a recent reverse split and a pr right the, now the pr in this case happened like the day after the reverse split. I typically like it, like normally it's like two or three or four days after, but um, one day after it kind of fits the same mold. It's a little early, but you know, the, the pattern is a reverse split. They attempt to go the first day on no PR, it doesn't go. Then a couple of days later, it pees out PRs and then they go. And then everyone who bought it for the first day is like, what the fudge? Like I knew this was gonna go up, right? So, you know, so like, and I also thought like, the reason why I was kind of quick to sell is because I, you know, I thought gurus were in. So I, I kind of tried to metagame the system. I tried to buy it and then short it and then cover it and then maybe rebuy later. Like I was trying to be, I was trying to be too fancy. I was trying to do, you know, do too much, but I bought it and so, and then I flipped short and, you know, you can see it didn't end well. I did get, you know, a nice front side short front side cover, right? You know, tried to recycle, you know, tried to tried to recycle and cut it. Um, you know, tried to tried to trade it above 350, and you know, stock wasn't having it at all. Ended up cutting here. Then I said maybe if 350 is not going to work, maybe four is going to work. You know, and like I tried to trade a little bit under four, a little bit over four, with the idea that maybe four is the top. I'm trying to guess the top. It's not working out at all because it's definitely front side. And this was the spark for the, for the market, right? We've been kind of, we were dead all last week given the July 4th weekend. This was the spark. This was like, this is the trade that shorts have to look out for, right? And, and I got caught a little bit. But what saved me was my not going in more than half front side rule that I have totally saved me to keep trading it later on in the day. Um, CVS, this is a trade I did today. Um, this was... Um, this was a this was kind of a fun trade because it, it, it felt like a it felt like a low a small cap PR trade even though it's a large cap so I was actually kind of actually um, was pretty confident in this trade so CVS had um, CVS had a uh, a PR today that they're going to carry like two CBD products in their store from this company right and so what that like and so it gapped up like eight percent and so what that means is that like. I guess the, the, the most bullish thing about that is that CBS is entering into an emerging market, right? The emerging market being the, the, canna, the cannabis market. And so like, you know, like everyone's raging, you know, about the cannabis market. And so that's the most bullish thing about it. So like, but I felt the gap was a little too, like eight, seven, eight percent gaps, a pretty good gap for a, for a large gap. So for me, this was kind of like a small cap gapping, right? So I treated it that way. And I was like, yeah, it means you're entering the CBD market, but come on, like how much are these two products going to be percent as a percentage of their revenue? Like, does it really de deserve 8% market crap, mark, market crap, market cap increase? I didn't think so. So that's what, that's what built my bias on the stock. 
So the methodology for the trade was I came into the day and I was looking for the slam. I was looking for some indicator, some initial, you know, if it was just going to keep going up, I'm not going to short it. Right. But I wanted some kind of um, beginning signal that was going to tell me that this, like maybe this is going to be a short, the short's going to work out. And I got it pretty close to the open, right? This was a nice hard slam. And so now I'm thinking about pops, right? And so because it is, it's non-niche, right? Uh, I'm waiting to get in. I'm trying to be conservative with the stock. Um, I'm waiting for a lower high and I'm waiting for actually the lower high to confirm, right? I'm actually waiting for the top on the lower high to be put in. So I know I'm kind of maybe on the right side of the trend because I feel large caps and mid caps trend a lot cleaner than small caps. So that's kind of the basis of, I don't need to necessarily like on these trades, on these, on these trades, like I want to be, I want to be kind of part of the liquidity that the emotions are coming into. I'm not like that with large caps as much. Um, yeah, I guess I'll go over the CEI trade. Oh, I can do that. I can show that later. It's today. That's why. So yeah, I'm just making sure I'm still recording here. Okay. Um, yeah. So the market sentiment this week, um, a little bit more bullish than last week. Last week is a little bit kind of dead, but we're starting to see a little bit of excitement going on. CEI and Sol Soli's just been going nuts. Soli's just been punishing shorts like no tomorrow. But mostly reds, right? Mostly the, the big runners of the small cap line is mostly reds. CETX, VLX. I got some questions about like what made like VLRX and Codex, what, like why did they fade when CEI and, and um, BISL ripped? Well, I think there's definitely a float difference between the two. That was a good question I had this week. Like definitely the lower of the floats are going to have the most opportune, are going to be the most opportune to run. But also you keep in mind that once CEI happened, it's so much easier for VISL to run, right? Um, whereas after VISL had that offering and like totally tanked one day, right? And had that offering, um, that kind of kills the mojo for a stock like Codex, right? You know, like that, that popped up today, like, you know, like everyone just remembers the ISL, the offering, like maybe, maybe the, the, the bull, the small bull market's over. So that's always like sentiment is so strong in, in kind of formulating targets and, and maybe like being a different, maybe even formulating direction, even, you know, like if a piggy pops up, you know, like maybe you, maybe you just short and hold because of the most recent sentiment, or maybe you say, Shorts have been getting squeezed. May, I know it's a piggy, but piggies can fly, and that maybe alters your direction, right? So sentiment plays kind of a big role with me. Anyway, I tracked all the IPOs that were going on off a couple of weeks ago. Most of these are flat. All the blacks are flat. All the reds are all the reds are um, down, but these are barely down. I checked. The only one that's even slightly up is go. Most of these could just be black neutral, right? None of the IPOs really performed. Um, CEI is definitely creating vibes. VISL, I, I, you know, I'm still counting this as a positive just because how strong the sympathy was. It really went nuts. Almost stole the show from CEI on day two, which I think helped with my short on it today. Oh, was it today? No, it was yesterday, so I can't go over it. Anyway, um, Spy, Spy is, um, keeps trying to test 300, and I really like that. I think that's a very positive thing on the market. I, like I said, I don't want to see it reject and maybe go back down to the 280s and like consolidate and take a long time to break. I would much rather break 300. I think the market is, so, I think even the small cap market is more, is, is a lot busier when the market's at all time highs. And it's a really steady summer. Like, you know, like I keep waiting for the super deadness to come and it's just not coming. We're in July. I got rid of the July earnings season fear because it seems like we're, we're having a steady summer. So the SPY and CEI are the hopes. I didn't like the offering on VISL today. I mean, that's because I wasn't sure, but also just because I want, um, I don't, I, you know, whenever there's offering that kills vibes and a lot of red. So, you know, overall, I think we're kind of still in a middle market. I think we're more on the, on the bullish side than we were on the dead side last week. And so the last webinar I did on the discipline webinar, we were over here. And then the webinar I missed, we were last week was totally dead. And now I think we're coming back in here with the CEI and VISL stuff. So it's kind of still following this pattern here of this circle. But I noticed in the summer, the circle, the cycles are going really fast. It's almost like within a week, it's a week or two. And it's like a whole cycle has cycled through. Normally it's like two weeks here, two weeks here, you know, two or three weeks here. So I noticed that the cycle is kind of picking up like the, the rotations are smaller. 
right? It's like a smaller circle rather than a big, bigger circle. So one thing I want to talk about, like, so like, did, like I, I showed two examples of, of the same setup today and that was VIS, uh, oh, sorry, that was OSS and CETX, right? But I, I want to go over this and I had a phone call with someone about this today. Um, funny enough, it was in my webinar. Um, setups can have different variations, right? Um, no, no setup is ever going to look exactly the same, or if it does, it's probably like a long time ago, right? When it's the different variation, one, you know, it, when the different variations have changed a little bit over time and it's just kind of maybe looking like an older chart, but no setup's ever going to look exactly, exactly the same, like, you know, co consistently, continually. Um, because if setups were exactly the same, they wouldn't exist. And that's a paradoxical paradoxical statement, but it's basically, if, if there's a setup that's exploitable, it's going to get exploited, right? And so if it gets exploited, it ceases to exist. So this is why, um, in essence, trading is pretty hard because there's always a level of subjectivity, right? Setups need a certain amount of variation, a certain amount of question, a certain amount of doubt in order for the setup to exist, right? If there's ever a setup where you can figure out, oh, this is gonna happen 100%, you're not the only person who can figure that out. And if you're not the only person that can figure that out, then you two together aren't the only two people that can figure that out. And you know everyone's going to figure it out eventually, and thus it's gonna cease to exist. So this is how setups can change over time. Um, but like, uh, this is why um, trading, I think, I think, in essence, this is one of the hardest parts about trading because there, there's no, there needs to be this question, is this, the, the subjectivity, is this this setup to even exist? So it's good, like, like a solution to this is to kind of zoom out, like review your truck, review your trades on a weekly basis and just kind of like, you know, scoot back in your chair and look at the setup like, hey, is there like a, you know, like an A, B, C, or is this, you know, an X, Y, Z, or is there a pop consolidation drop? Like, you know, just zoom out and look at the pattern, right? Or maybe you include some fundamental stuff, right? Like, uh, yeah, so time frames. So this is just a, I, I, it's something I wanted to talk about for a long time. I could, we could literally talk about this for hours, but like I tried to condense it. Um, basically, um, you have to know what kind of time frame you're trading. You have to know what kind of time frame you're good at, right? Like everyone's good at different time frames. I mean, I remember talking to another uh, trader. I think last week about a large cap swing short um, where I think he was trading off a 30 minute chart on a stock that was bouncing off of a long term daily chart trend. And he um, was shorting, I think into the eight, I think he was shorting into the low nineties, but um, the trend totally, you know, like could look like it could go to 94, 95, 96 and still match his downtrend pattern. I just went up a couple more dollars maybe than you, than uh, it was at currently. And so we talked about it and we're like, yeah, so what's your time frame for the trade, right? Like if you're trading a daily chart downwind trend, you kind of got to give it the room a daily chart deserves, right? So this is just a classic example. Like we'll, we see this so many times in the small cap land where a stock will run up and let's say this is like let's say this is like a hundred percent or something like this, right? This is like a hundred percent already. Then we get up to like 150% or something like this. And then, you know, we start to fade hard and we start downtrending. Now this, and I intentionally made it look so perfect, right? This can, this could be drawn out like this. This, this could like maybe turn into like what looks like a wedge, right? And it looks like a total downtrending wedge and then by, and then back up the basic, idea is that the trend is holding is a larger time frame trend line that's just holding right and you got to be cognizant of that when you're you're trading these socks that are up 100 200 percent that are up too much and you think that they just can't go higher and that they totally can cei is a perfect example bpth all of these big runners almost spilled my uh, this is an example where like you can start to think that like it, like this could stuff so hard right like we could have a death candle right here at the top. Like a death candle at the top might not necessarily mean that the whole move is over, right? It, that could just mean that this move is over, right? The, uh, a huge death candle here at the top 
does not necessarily mean that the entire move for the whole day is over. It could literally just mean that this move, this time frame, this time frame, this front side, this is the back side to this time frame, right? But you got to be considerate of this higher low. And if we stop over here, this does not, just because there's a death candle at high a day does not mean that it's guaranteed to roll over. And this was CEI in a nutshell, right? If I want to scroll back up to CEI. This was like, this is, this is it right here, right? This is it. Bam. You know, like harsh pull, harsh pull. It's over. Nope, it's not over, right? It's the exact same thing here. This, of course, looks steeper, but this is just, a, you got to account for that with variation. So my rules for this, or rule, rule of thumb, guideline, like style, I guess is a better word, is I always look at one, one time frame larger because, um, and this is just solely relevant on the fact that my patience is probably only tied to one time frame larger than my trading. So if I'm trading a one minute chart, I'm probably not going to, like the 15 minute chart would give me a bigger time frame chart, but it's probably not the one that I can even hold for anyway. Like it's less relevant to me than the one, than the, than the immediate larger time frame, which I would consider the five minute time frame. And that's just me. I would group it one, five, and fifteen. But um, uh, like so, like if I'm a one minute trader, I want to look at the five minute higher lows. Like I'm, like I would assume this is a one minute and this is a five minute. Like I might look if this was a five minute chart, then this would be the fifteen, I guess, for me. But I don't do that. Hey traders, this is Tosh. I go by T Bradley ninety in the My Investing Club chat. Just wanted to reach out and say if you have any questions about MIC. Joining MIC, maybe you're a member already. You have three ways to contact myself personally and through MIC. You can hit our social media. You can hit me through PMs in chat, or you can contact us through my email at tosh at myinvestingclub.com. That's T-O-S-H at myinvestingclub.com. I will get back to you in a timely manner, and I'm saying this because I'm here to help, and I don't want anybody to be afraid to reach out and ask any question that they have. We are here for you guys. All right, see you guys.